That's coming. First, one year ago, I made this video describing how I'd gone from a complete cycling novice to a reasonably okay rider in just 500 days. My fitness was up, my weekends full of excitement, my legs jacked, all thanks to the humble bicycle. At the time, I thought I was embarking on a long and exciting journey, setting sail to visit new levels of sporting performance. Turns out, I was on the Titanic. I want you to draw me like one of your French girls. Heading for an iceberg made of donuts and disappointment. Because in this video, what happens when the wheels come off the bike? Not that type of wheel. I mean figuratively. I haven't cycled in 200 days. So how is my fitness now? I'll test it. What am I doing at the weekends? I'll show you. And are the legs still jacked? Not that type of jack. In case you've not seen the previous video, here is a quick summary. In early 2020, it became evident that poor levels of health and fitness and excess body fat in a world with COVID was not ideal. The government's advice was stay indoors, watch Netflix, eat junk, and as long as I used an antibacterial wipe on my Domino's delivery, I could just wait for science to solve the problem without any need for personal responsibility. So realising that our government knows as much about health and fitness as The Rock knows about post-Brexit bilateral trade agreements, well, that's a good one. I bought a Wahoo kicker and started pedalling. Now, aside from a little mountain biking to go on summer picnics, it was the first cycling of any sort I had done since retiring from my paper round following a near miss with a fallen coniper tree the morning after the great storm of 87. The weather will become very windy. And I loved it. I got into racing on Zwift. I even went out and bought a TT bike and did a couple of duathlons. I already had a reasonable aerobic fitness from the running that I had used over the previous 10 years or so to go from dangerously overweight to in shape. But with cycling, I found the combination of explosive power that was needed at times along with the cardiovascular work, a really enjoyable mix. I was hooked and cycling became a habit. And that was partly because of how the bike was always ready to go. Sat there in the garage, nothing between me and jumping on it a few times a week. I could use it whenever I liked. But like anything that becomes easy to have, boredom can set in. So only a couple of months after that last video, when I thought I was perfectly placed to carry on my long-term relationship with the bike, I was actually about to be tempted elsewhere. Because the end of last year and into the beginning of this, I started messing around with functional fitness, hybrid training that mixed cardio with heavy lifting, and then high rocks competitions. If cycling had become a dependable, reliable, but slightly unexciting partner, high rocks was a slutty new alternative. Where cycling would say, how about a nice easy zone two session, high rocks would leave me on my hands and knees gasping for air. Cycling would say, the garage is chilly, you can leave your socks on if you like, Hyrox would say, sweat till you have none left, and show me all your muscles. And when cycling said, well done, here's a virtual trophy that no one will see, Hyrox said, you're a beast, I want to give you something special, and let's do it in public. Call me easily led, I was easily led. And then to cap it all, cycling had never been too keen on incorporating my wife into proceedings. She would spend time alone while I pedalled away up cartoon mountains. But Hyrox said, got a photo? I'll bring her along. And that was it. I was 100 wall balls deep into high rocks. I told the bike, it's not you, it's me, and left it to gather dust. In fact, I have to go back about 200 days to early spring of this year to find any record of me cycling regularly. And even then, it was only once or twice a week. And since then, nothing. I've not cycled properly for months. Now, you may think, does that matter? It sounds like you simply replaced one thing with another. But high rocks and the training style that goes with it is a very different thing. It is quite possible to incorporate cycling into your day with an approach that allows it to just be there in the background without any negative impact on the rest of your life. You can still exercise in other ways as well, try different sports now and then, but remain a committed cyclist. High rocks is a little more demanding. It wants all of your time and 100% of your attention. Take your eye off the ball and it will boil your bunny quicker than you can say burpee broad jump. And that is what happened to me. After a high rocks race in April, I decided to put my training on hold. I was feeling pretty burnt out. All that hardcore hybrid stuff has resulted in me taking a bit of a pounding something I'd not felt at all during my cycling period because that is just so low impact in comparison. And when I did finally decide to get up and move about again, 
it appeared Hyrox Fitness doesn't stick around while you moan about sore knees. It leaves you. One of the first indications of that was a competition during the summer that resulted in me staggering around like a giant old mess. Now what I should have done was go back to basics. With my tail between my legs I could have returned to a routine of jogging regularly, cycling regularly, eating well, a process that I know has worked in the past, and use that as a foundation for fitness, get that sorted and then build on it. But I didn't. I tried to dive back into high rocks training and just hoped that doing 500 meter rows and farmer's carries would make up for generally being fat and out of shape. But that approach has hit a brick wall. In my most recent high rocks competition, I ran alongside Jen for the first time. I say alongside, I mean struggling behind, trying to keep up. It was a slap to the face with a cooked rabbit. So time for a reset. A little over a week ago, I tidied up the garage, I lined up the Wahoo kicker in front of the TV, and I set out to repeat what has worked before. Regular, consistent use of cycling, along with running, to provide me that base fitness. The rest can then follow. Now rather than leap straight into a race, I thought an easy group ride might be a nice way back in, and so I set off for an hour's session with hundreds of others, and immediately questioned why I'd ever stopped doing this. The sense that you are exercising among other like-minded people scattered across the world, yet brought together through technology and a love of taking your health seriously, is truly inspiring. I thought this might only be a C category ride, and therefore going at a pace a bit slower than I've been used to in the past, but it's going to be a really enjoyable 60 minutes. 30 minutes later they dropped me and I was cycling through the desert all alone. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. No it is not. So I decided to get back on the saddle sooner rather than later and find out whether that had simply been a one-off, a bad day, a glitch, or something worse. And so a few days later I raced. But to give myself a reasonable chance of doing okay, I picked one of my favourite races, a short, fast one, where my aerobic fitness is less of an issue and I can just rely on brute power to hustle my way to the front. I got dropped two minutes in. Historically, in this exact same race, I've occasionally been left behind at the top of the hill that is coming up. I have to admit, it's a new experience to get left behind at the bottom of the hill. So last place, with an average wattage of 284, which is worryingly low for such a short race, jumped back to the same event from January, where I came a much more respectable middle of the pack, and I'd averaged 374 watts, one of the highest average wattage figures among all riders in that race. And so I thought what I really need to do is understand where I'm at. And so to the 4DP cycling fitness test. I've taken this test three times before, once when I very first began cycling in April 2020, and then two months after that because I felt I'd made some quick newbie gains. And then after those 500 days to see how far I'd gone. So while you watch me warm up from just a couple of days ago, let me explain the test. You hook your bike to the device running things, in my case my iPhone with Bluetooth, and follow instructions. Easy. Theoretically easy. There are four measures it takes. Your maximum wattage over five seconds, over one minute, over five minutes, and perhaps most importantly over 20 minutes. The 20 minute test result is not literally what you generate during the 20 minute test, but rather it uses a formula to calculate what, if you were fresh, you would be likely to sustain for a one hour ride, your FTP, your functional threshold power. Let's do my previous numbers at the end when we can compare them to my new results and just jump straight to the discomfort. So test number one is a five second maximum effort. This is me doing the test last September. Interestingly, 95 kilos here versus my current 100. So of all the things assessed, this might be the one where I'm actually still okay. More weight can generate more downforce, gravity helping me produce power. I don't know what I'm talking about, that might be nonsense. The results would suggest it probably is. It was horrible, but more concerning was that it was concerning. My quads, after the two efforts that you're allowed at the test, were absolutely just on fire. It did not bode well for what was to come. And what was to come was probably the most disgusting part of the whole thing. Five minutes maximum effort. I vividly remember this from last September where I tried my hardest to hold 400 watts. I failed just in that attempt, averaging 392 and my heart rate bumping up into the 180s. And because I had such a clear recollection of that, 
I was well aware as I took the test again this time how bad it was going. I was struggling to hold over 300 watts at times and yet my heart rate was only in the 160s. I wasn't out of breath. My legs just did not have it in them. I finished it in as much discomfort as last time but psychologically much worse off. I didn't know exactly what my final result would be but I knew it wouldn't be good. <sighs> Test number three is probably the most relevant real-world assessment, your 20-minute wattage. The result of this is run through a calculation to produce your theoretical functional threshold power, your FTP, the power you could generate over an hour. I've scored 307 last September, and that was consistent with what I would see during longer rides on Zwift. I could be 20, 30, 40 minutes deep into a race, be doing 280, 290 watts and feel confident I could maintain that to the finish line, maybe even pick it up a little. My plan had been to go off at high 200s and halfway through the test, as the test allows you to do, increase my effort for the second half if I felt I could maintain a bit extra. But at halfway, I was done. I struggled to keep it low 200s. The thing was a nasty from start to finish. And the final test, a cheeky one minute blast. I remember last September going off at around 800 watts, fading as I expect you to, but trying to hold it above 500 watts to the finish, heart rate in the 180s. This time around, heart rate not getting into the 170s, legs on absolute fire, and despite my best efforts, the wattage even gets below 400 before the end. <sighs> 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 Five second sprint. April 2020, ridden the bike only two or three times before taking the test, still having flashbacks to the conifer tree, 1,260 watts. After two months of hard training, 1,364, and then last September, 1,277, demonstrating that unless you specifically train sprinting, you don't necessarily get much better at sprinting. This time, 1,002 watts. It's a little embarrassing. The one minute effort. In a race, this is the bit I enjoy. A minute to go to the finish line. I used to be confident that anybody around me at that stage was in trouble. April 2020, 447. Two months later, 627. 500 days later, 649. This week, 486. The five minute test. 235 watts increased to 330 watts increased to 392 watts by September. 303 watts this time. It's less than my FTP result from last September. Talking of which, the big one, 20 minute FTP result. A rather grim 199 watts in April 2020, two months later, and this jump probably more about just getting used to cycling than fitness, 255 watts, and then 307 watts FTP after a solid 500 days of training. This time around, 234 watts. So where does that all leave me? In a brilliant place. These last few sessions on the bike, the group ride, the race, the test have all reminded me how easy and convenient it is to jump in the garage and push myself on that thing and to not take advantage of being able to do so. That's ridiculous. And those numbers are fine. I know what was required to get to where I got last September. And so getting back to that point will be easier than first time around. Which leaves only one issue, how will I avoid boredom and being sucked in a new direction by temptation elsewhere? A two-step plan. Firstly, I now know the consequence of abandoning cycling and the pain involved in having to rekindle that relationship from scratch. I just won't make the same mistake twice. But to be sure, step two, boredom's unlikely because things are going to be a little dirtier this time around. I've got myself a gravel bike. So unlike last year where the English weather meant that my only cycling option was in the garage, I can now spend the weekends getting filthy out and about. I will still do the occasional high rocks race. In fact, I will still do all manner of other activities, but they will now be the icing on the cake. Uh, now, you might not work because they were the icing on the cake last time. It's just that all I ate last time was the icing. This time there'll be the icing, but I will be eating mostly cake. I'm now just hungry. In summary, what impact does not cycling for 200 days have on your cycling? Well, in my experience, it smashes it to pieces. But who cares? I've said many times that roller coasters go up and down because that's simply more fun that way. Before I know it, I will be keeping up on group rides, completing races with other competitors 
at least in sight still, and turning in some slightly more respectable numbers. And legs jacked again. Still not that type.